Everybody hear me okay? I'm going to stand off to the side rather than standing behind the podium. And I'll hear you. Okay. <laughs> okay, how about that? Okay. Um, again, my name is Beverly Bilal, and I'm the entomologist for the South Sierra Shared Service Area. So I handle all the national forests from the Lake Tahoe region all the way down to the Sequoia National Forest. Um, so I do have a very big service area, and I am very aware of all the activity that's happening right now um, in the South Sierras. And I wanted to talk to you today about kind of the activity that's going on, but kind of look at it also from a much larger, broader perspective. I know some folks in the back probably really can't see the presentation that I'm about to give. And I want to apologize ahead of time that I did, um, even though there's printouts of my presentation, I did alter it slightly. Um, kind of as I was going through it. Um, so there's a lot of the same slides, but they may just be in a different order. So um, please, you know, please just bear with me and just take notes as, as needed. But also for the folks in the back, CAL FIRE has very um, generously, um, as well as the, as well as their MCRCD, um, very nicely put, uh, put out these tree notes. And you might have seen them on the back table um, and by the sign-up sheet here. But these tree notes, there's one for um, a few of the bark beetles that I'm going to be talking about, the western pine beetle. It's otherwise known as pine engraver, the red turpentine beetle. Um, and these give you a little bit more about the biology um, and management tools that you'll need to know. So you, uh, please feel free to grab some of these and look them over. Also, my group, um, Forest Health Protection for the Forest Service, developed these bark beetles in California conifers. And this talks about a few more bark beetles um, that, aren't, that aren't in the tree notes. Um, and this is actually a really very good thorough guide of kind of how to identify your trees. So two, the bark beetles are associated with those trees. Some management in terms of chemical as well as subculture. Um, and maybe expectations as well of what to expect when you have these kinds of insects or disease problems. So I really want you to, um, if you don't get anything out of, out of my presentation or you might miss a lot of it, please really refer to these these handouts, as well as this one in particular. Okay? So I know that media has talked a lot about drought and how bad our drought is, but I thought I'd come at it from a different perspective, and that is just talking about drought in terms of not just the amount of water that we don't have, but also in terms of how dry everything is out there. And one of the indexes we use is the Palmer Drought Severity Index, which is a measure of that dryness, which is also based on water as well as temperature. So one of the issues that we have is that not only do we have water, but we're having really warm summers, much hotter than average, um, sometimes even record-breaking record breaking days, but we're also having really warm winters. And that um, is really, you know, it's really conducive to a lot of pest outbreaks as well. Um, and so as we know, and as we've seen, um, these are actually images from the Sequoia National Forest and surrounding areas, that tree mortality really has been increasing as the drought's been getting more and more severe. We're seeing a lot of more, you know, tree mortality out in the landscape. Um, in my group, we do a, we, we do a lot of models. We try to develop a lot of predictions or estimates of what of how bad we think the mortality is going to get. And we do aerial surveys to you know really kind of look at those patterns and trends over the landscape. And what we found, um, and I know again folks in the back will be able to see this, but um, over 2 million trees died from bark beetles, which will, 
um, across eight, about eight, 800,000 acres in 2014, which was double the amount of acres from 2013. So we've definitely seen already this um, significant jump, and we really expect just as much, or if not, a double increase um, for 2015. Just because we know we're going, again, into a fourth year of drought, it's going to be hot, we don't have much water left, um, but that we're already seeing a, a, you know, a fairly amount of high bar beetle activity already happening, and that it's been increasing um, for the past three years. So, again, I want to really look at this from a broader perspective. I don't want to, I'll, I'll get into the biology of the bark beetle, but again, I want folks um, to look at this from kind of an integrated pest management standpoint. Because, you know, um, while we have Roundup, you know, and we can just focus on killing weeds or something, we still kind of have to look at the complex of why the bark beetles are here in the first place, or why we're seeing the activity that we are to the extent that we are, but also, you know, where and why. So, you know, for any successful IPM program to work, we've got to look at all those factors that play into, again, kind of why the activity is happening. So we have at the top of the triangle, this triangle gets used a lot for fire, for um, a lot of planning that the Forest Service does. So this triangle is actually pretty important. And this is our pest complex triangle. So pests are at the very top. The hosts or the pines, the trees, are at one, um, one corner, and the environment is in the other corner. And we know that all of these factors interact with each other. They're not, you know, singular identities that, you know, kind of respond only when when one happens. So they all kind of interact and they, you know, and they play on each other. So, you know, in one corner we have the environment. And sometimes there's not really too much we can do about the environment. I mean, we really can't force more water to happen. We're in a drought. We know that. And so, so when we think about, well, this pest complex, what part of it is it that we can manipulate to try to, you know, affect the others? So I just want you to keep that in mind, you know, as I'm going through my talk. So for most pine trees, um, they actually have more than one bark beetle affecting them. Again, which is why you have three or four different handouts talking about a multitude of different beetles. Um, and, you know, these insects really... Um, really like to not invade each other's space, which is how they stay successful. They find their own, you know, niche on a tree. And so, so for uh, your standard ponderosa pine, the primary bark beetle that you'll hear about the most is western pine beetle, because it is considered its primary bark beetle. It is the one that will attack a large, um, a large share of the tree and kill it. So it takes about 80% of the space right in the middle of the bowl, uh, right in the middle of the trunk, and you'll hear about the pine engravers of those ips that feed um, in the smaller diameter part of the tree or in smaller diameter trees overall. But then at the lower half, you have a different set of beetles working in that part of the tree. So you do have quite a complex happening in one single tree alone. And then when the tree's dead, you have a completely different complex of other damaging agents and decomposing agents to have to deal with. So again, those are just things to think about in this, you know, as your tree is either dying or it's healthy, you know, at what phase you need to start thinking about your management plan. So we'll focus right now on the top part of the triangle, which are the pests. Um, primarily right now, right, the bark beetles. So just some general biology about them is that for most of the conifers in California, they do kind of have one primary um, bark beetle or damaging agent that affects them the most. And so for each pine or fir out there, there is, there is um, kind of one, again, damaging agent. For the bark beetles, they actually typically, typically prefer 
prefer the larger trees in which to develop their brood. So again, I'm talking about kind of the normal precept years, kind of that background mortality um, when, you know, when populations are fairly low. Um, they're usually targeting those much bigger trees. And they're little. They're very, very small. If anyone's seen them, um, they're only about the size of a grain of rice. So when you think about how an insect like that has to be successful, it has to, one, it has to work in very, very large numbers. But also it has to work for against a host or, yeah, I guess a host or to find suitable habitat that won't fight it back very much, right? So it's going to go for those mostly weakened or diseased um, or injured trees. And some of those attacks, again, thinking about the where, those attacks are, you know, when trees are injured or they're weak, a lot of that has to do with the site conditions. Why are they injured or weak is because of maybe the conditions that they're living in, that these trees are developing in, that don't make them the most vigorous, healthy trees on the, you know, in the area. So, you know, we, could, we, we as foresters, when we look at the bark beetles, we talk a lot about stalking, about the microclimate, about the tree density. And, you know, again, in background years, that mortality can be singular or it can be grouped. So again, the western pine beetle, um, I think the tree notes, yeah, they talk about the gallery patterns if you want to look under the bark or check to see if you have an infestation. Um, this is very characteristic of what it looks like when you pull off the bark and you see the adult patterns underneath. And so the way the bark beetles cause tree mortality is as the name implies. They feed, they feed actually right underneath the bark. So I'll talk about wood borers, but wood borers, as that name implies, go deep into the wood. The bark beetles really like to hang out, unfortunately, right in the living parts of the tree. They like to hang out in the cambium and phloem layer, um, which is, you know, when you're trying to age a tree, these trees grow, you know. And that's, again, the living part of it that tends to start growing out when you get that growth. But unfortunately, that's where bark beetles like to do all of their like to do all of their thing. That's where they colonize, mate, and reproduce, and that's where then their brood or the larvae start feeding in. So you have these adult galleries that lay eggs. Um, I know you really can't see them, but there's really... Uh, anyways. Beverly? Oh. Blender. <laughs> And I'm sorry again, I apologize to people in the back, um, but you know, at the at the end of this dark, you know, dark band where the adult beetles um, have been feeding in, they lay eggs right along the edges of those galleries, and it's from there that then the larvae start moving out and feeding at 90 degrees. And so this actually develops kind of a physical girdling effect on the tree. And then to top it off, so not only do they have, you know, small size, and there's, you know, um, that they have a large clutch of eggs, you know, that are also developing, um, they also wage biological warfare. So they, they introduce fungi that help them to overcome and overwhelm the tree very quickly because again, they don't want their host to be fighting back. So they carry um, some symbiotic fungi um, in different parts of their body that again, help them to overwhelm and help clog the tree to kind of suffocate it a whole lot more quickly and kill it off so that way the brood can survive without being pitched out. And then so at background levels, again, they're, they're usually targeting those stressed and weakened trees. However, when there's lots of populations of them, and there's you know, what we call really high beetle pressure, even healthy trees can really be overwhelmed. But you know, these bark beetles are native. So they're not, 
you know, trying to do an eradication program is really not what we want to do because they're always out there, they've evolved with these trees. They are a natural form of disturbance, just like fire, just like windstorms and snow. These beetles create, you know, openings in the forest, they create habitat for wildlife, so they have their ecological role. But again, they're very small. So they need those opportunities of a sick tree or a weakened tree out in the landscape, you know, to continue and to reproduce. So they look for trees that have some kind of prior disease infection, are weakened um, by mechanical injury, not just fire, but also, you know, people injuring tree roots by lawnmowers or weed whackers. Um, but also they can be predisposed by other insects. For those of you that live in the Sierras or around um, Whiskey Ridge area, there's a, we have a defoliator, a native defoliator called Douglas for tussock moth that likes to it's a caterpillar that likes to feed on the needle, and you know that can predispose trees and make them weak, and then you'll have subsequent bark beetle infection. But again, really the main driving force that triggers a lot of the outbreaks that we see in California really is drought, the lack of water. So, the way bark beetles find each other out into the forest, again, the where, um, they facilitate, this is facilitated through uh, volatile com chemical communications or, as you know, pheromones. I think most species in the animal kingdom have ways that they call out to each other or they sense, you know, um, I don't know, guess behavioral patterns from each other and this is based on those pheromones. And so when bark beetles are trying to find their host in the woods and the kind of the pioneer bark beetles are looking for that, you know, that good tree to land on, they find their tree and the way they call other bark beetles in to start developing that really large mass attack is that they first initiate with aggregation pheromones. So this, as the name implies, again, these pheromones then set out and say, hey, I found a tree, come join my party, and then I'll be happy at this tree. And so once that happens, and it can happen within a matter of two weeks. So it, can, it really has to happen. Again, they're very small. They need to overwhelm a host very quickly. So these aggregation pheromones get sent out and lots of beetles, you know, in the surrounding area, and they, they can still fly. So they may not want to fly very far, but if they get a good wind, they can travel. Um, so once they've initialized or colonized, you know, one kind of central tree in the stand, unfortunately, you always have latecomers to the party. So once the tree is full, then those beetles that have made it to the party early now send out and then they kick in their anti-aggregation pheromones, which then say, hey, you know, this tree is full, go find yourself someplace else to go. And that's where you get kind of this group mortality effect, is that again, these latecomers are coming in and they need, they just end up on that tree, but they're getting kicked off because there's no, no more place for them to, to reproduce and develop. So they land on adjacent trees. And again, it's a site condition too. So it's not just one tree you're looking at. If a tree is weak in one, in kind of one location, there's a good chance that the rest of the trees might also be feeling those same effects, right? You know. So you know. So again, this is why we see kind of this group mortality with western pine beetle, and this is a switching mechanism where adjacent trees are tagged, and again, can lead to group mortality. So, if you want to find out what attacked your tree, um, you can hack into the bark um, and then look for the galleries underneath. Pine Engraver has a more vertical gallery, and then it's got its, uh, its brood developing right again at 90 degrees off of that. The western pine beetle kind of more has what we call a serpentine gallery, where it's winding all over the place. But I need to say it, if you're, if you're talking into your tree and you're already seeing you know, this much development of the galleries, then your tree is probably, the crown's probably already turned red or it will be dying soon. 
These are really indicators of successful attack. If you don't want to hack into your tree, especially if it's still got a partially green crown, what you might want to look for is uh, boring dust. Trees can be so stressed by, by drought nowadays that they might not even develop that pitch, which usually is kind of what the, um, you know, the primary defense mechanism is that resin, which not only slightly poisons the beetle, but actually physically pushes them out as the beetles are trying to bore into the bark. So again, with our trees, we might have so much stress on some of them, they're not developing any pitch. So you have to look up close and you might see some boring dust mixed into the crevices or actually caught in spider webs around the base. Um, and this boring dust is a mix of bark shavings and frass. To see if it's fairly successful too, the, the dust itself will be kind of a reddish brown in color. And then everyone knows about pitch tubes, I'm assuming. Um, which is, you know, again, if a tree has still got some vigor to it, it'll still develop the pitch, or it'll still have some background reserves of pitch. So you still may see pitch tubes, um, you know, the resin accumulation at the point of the attack. But I want to say that don't, don't always go for presence of pitch tubes. And, you know, for those larger, larger landowners and you know if you're trying to look for signs of you know attack um, you know over the landscape again or where activity is happening you can see it because again there's that group mortality or even if you're standing away from a tree and you look up into the you know you want to see well if it hasn't been infested in the upper half you might see some woodpecker activity or where the bark's been pulled off because the woodpeckers really like to forage on those bark beetle larvae. So even on green trees, you might see this flucking again of the bark. If a tree's been dead um, for quite a while, or you know, if you want to just wonder if it was bark beetle that killed it, uh, <coughs> this is a separate fungus that comes in. It's a decomposing fungus. But again, it's just an indicator that your tree's been attacked by bark beetles and that it's been dead actually for a while. This, this fungus comes in about a year or two after a bark beetle infestation. So again, thinking about the triangle and about, you know, at what, at, what of, at which point of this do we want to actually do some kind of management? And there are management out there. We can actually, we can actually manipulate the environment to some degree. We really can. So by, by um, you know, by altering your host to your diversity, you can actually change the environment to unfavorable conditions for bark beetles. So there are silvicultural cultural, uh, management options. There are chemicals out there, and I'll go into detail. Um, there are semiochemicals that, mm, uh, and, and no action. No action is still a management option. So I just want you to keep that in mind. So again, for those you know larger, larger landowners, we really try to focus on prevention because again, these are native bark beetles. Trying to do some direct control or suppression is just going to be incredibly difficult. And for western pine beetle, it doesn't work at all. So I just want you to keep that in mind. So we really try to promote, uh, we really try to, you know, promote prevention at the forefront to think about, you know, before the beetles come. Because right now at this stage, there's a lot of beetles out there. There's a lot of dead trees out there. So maybe even focusing on your green stands while you think, well, I need to focus on getting these red trees out there, you might want to focus on, well, how can I keep the trees that I have still alive? Focus on those green stands. So you want to promote diversity. And that's a great thing about California, is that we don't have this big red you know, patch like they do in Colorado or Wyoming. It's because we have a lot of mixed conifers and we have a lot of diversity in California. So we'd like to promote species diversity. And you can have selective tree removal, or you can, 
they got that wrong. I, I think what I wanted to say at that, with, that, with that bullet was just um, uh, planting trees that are native to the site. I know a lot of people like really pretty ornamentals, but you know, trying to have trees too, maybe like redwoods um, or coastal redwoods, you know, may not be the right choice for growing up here in our foothills. So those are something to keep in mind. But you can have diversity in not just species. You can have it in age class, you can have it in vertical, and you can have it in composition. So there are many ways to think about having diversity on the landscape. Patch cuts, roof selection, you know, different age classes. Again, as I showed you from my, uh, my past slide, that certain bark beetles like certain diameters. Western pine beetle really doesn't like those larger diameter trees. So if you have a lot of small pines on your property, you might want to promote those. Um, or think about, well, if I have pines dying, think about planting new ones. You know, and even that bark beetle mortality, you know, contributes to that diversity, promotion of other species. So again, these are really just basic forestry practices that I'm talking about. They're not anything unusual, even for bark beetles, because if you promote good, healthy trees in the forest, you usually don't have a problem. So again, planting the proper trees for sites, minimizing damage to trees if you have a driveway um, next to your pine that you really, you know, really want to save. Try not parking right underneath it, trying to save its finer tree roots around it. Um, ensure good growing space, reducing the competition. I know a lot of people like to have trees for screening, but trees grow up, and so they need you know, more resources as they develop and as they get bigger. Um, I mentioned watering or some kind of irrigation, but that can be tricky, and you know, I want to, I, I will say that there's not been a lot of research. This might be something you might want to talk about with, with your master gardener about um, kind of, you know, if you're going to do kind of that very, you know, delicate tree care, watering, watering may help to some degree. Um, but also, if anyone knows what dwarf mistletoe infections are, uh, for pines, it can actually be very stressful. And that's, again, it's just one other compounding factor that makes for weakened or injured trees. So if you have those in your pines, you can prune them out. For oaks, it's a completely different story, and Martin will probably go into that when he talks about oaks. So again, as I mentioned, for western pine beetle, direct, su direct beetle suppression means that even if you've got infested trees on your yard, I do, I do encourage you to remove them. But it's not really so much that you're removing the beetles from the site. It's that you are actually altering the stand conditions. So what you're creating is more opening in the, in the stand itself, where it might have been closed, you're creating a gap, you're creating more airflow, you're altering again the, the original condition that it was before that invited or attracted the beetles in the first place. So again, I do encourage you to remove those trees, but if you have the luxury of possibly even doing some more stand thinning, like if you see this tractor, it's got a pretty dense area behind it that you can't even see into the horizon. And that kind of an area could really use some thinning because beetles really don't like, don't like areas that are very open is because there's a lot of wind passing through it. And usually trees that are, have much more growing space, much more, um, much more light or sunlight available to them are healthier trees. So it's, you know, so again, say it one more time, you can focus on removing your red trees, and I do encourage you to do so, especially if they're hazards. But also think about kind of, again, your larger landscape, your whole area that maybe you could do a little bit more work in to even prevent incoming beetles this year. And you'd want to consult that with your local, local forester or, or RFP. So I will mention some pesticides 
And I'm only going to mention pesticides that the Forest Service um, has actually studied and, and would promote. And it's not that you know we don't promote pest control companies, it's just that we just haven't had much experience with a lot of the other, these other chemicals. Um, a few things about uh, chemical sprays, they can be very expensive because you're spraying one tree at a time. Um, you need to get a fair amount of chemical per tree. But they are highly effective. They can give you one to two years of protection. However, if we continue to be in drought, um, and even if we get a good rain year, trees take a while to recover. So you might want to, again, the Integrated Pest Management Program, you might want to think about doing other things other than just spraying the one tree or your few trees. And these chemicals are toxic to non-target organisms. So that's something also to keep in mind. <coughs> oh man, I should have used red. Uh, but it says so in your, in, in this handbook, um, carbaryl based. Now this is the one we really high, highly promote. Carbaryl as the active ingredient for these topical preventive chemical sprays. Um, these provide two years of protection, two seasons. Proper timing and application, and proper application is very, very important. You really do need a professional to be spraying these, not just for the California you know, regulation, but also you need a high-powered hose. And again, I don't know if you can see the picture um, for folks in the back, but you need a high-powered hose to be spraying a lot of chemical and to get high enough into the tree. Because as I, again, showed you that one picture, um, western pine beetle attacks that whole bowl of the tree up until about the top six inches of its diameter. So it's got a whole large amount of, of space that it will infest. And again, these, uh, these require um, qualified applicators. And it's usually the seven formulations, the brand new seven, um, that we've been using and, and studying. So there's some pyrethroid based chemicals out there. Um, these we found have not been so effective. They provide about one year of treatment. They might be a little bit um, less in cost, but again, you know, it's because they only provide one year of protection. And so with these as well, you might want to consider doing additional types of management or different types of other treatments in conjunction with this one. There is a new soil-based um, chemical out there that Clark Pest Control made the effort to come by my office and tell me about. And I just want to mention it just because I know you've probably heard about it. Um, this one is a soil injection, so you don't have to worry about big chemical runoff or drift or worry about, you know, to really infect other organisms. Again, I just mentioned it. It's not that I don't promote it or I don't support it. I just don't have that much experience with it. So, you know, feel free to look into it. Your neighbors might have already tried it. See what, see what comes out of it. Again, I just haven't had much experience, so I can't really speak too much about it, but I really thought I would mention it. Oh, and this one is a different active ingredient. This one is called emamectin benzoate, and uh, uh, the product is, uh, or the brand name is triage, kind of cute. Now, a lot of folks have also been, you know, looking online about bark beetles and looking a lot of, uh, looking up a lot of research. And in other parts of, you know, of the West, we have different bark beetles and we have different forest types. And so there are lots of different products that have also been developed like, um, like synthetic pheromones. And and they have found some of these pheromones to be very effective. However, no one's found them to be effective in California forests yet. So the only pheromone that's actually been pretty effective is Douglas fir beetle um, in Douglas fir. And we don't have that issue. 
So you might have heard of using these verbenone packages that look like about, a, you know, about the size of a slice of cheese. They're being used against mountain pine beetle in Colorado, but they are not registered here in California. And again, you're targeting a different bark beetle. So I just want you to think about that again when you're thinking about your management. You really have to know your host and the pest that you're trying to target. Um, some gentleman talked to me about a completely different chemical that he paid all this money for and he was about to apply it, but it wasn't going to be effective at all. And it was actually going to injure his tree. So I was glad to get a hold of him when I did. But again, these are this, it's the trade name is Beetle Block. It is not registered in California, but we are doing some research with it. And again, no action, no action is always an option. It really depends on what your management objectives are. Um, you might want to be creating wildlife habitat, or you know maybe some areas um, might need a little bit more vegetation or debris on the ground or whatever. But you know other things to think about, or at least we as a forest think about. We think about public safety and we think of fuel loading. But you know again, dead trees create you know, create habitat for wildlife, and they can also create those changes in composition as well. Um, there is a tree note on, on, where is it, its beetles in California, and the reason you worry about this one is for green slash, and I mean green slash is when you're taking down live trees, when you're actually thinking about dropping maybe some of those green trees in your yard, that aren't infested, but you want to, again, open up the stand, create more airflow, alter that environment. And so you don't want to have another problem with a different bark beetle happening. And so if you read that tree note, it's very thorough about the management that you need to do to prevent um, um, pine engravers from infesting that slash and then killing your, you know, killing your remaining residual trees. So, I won't go too much into that, but this is where you know we talk about doing any kind of tarping or wrapping in plastic um, or leaving you know making piles of wood. Again, it's um, it, it's a lot. Um, you know, there's a lot more detail than that, and um, it, it is covered fairly well in this uh, in the tree notes by Carl. <coughs> Um, I just wanted to mention foothill pine too because you know people actually like some people actually like foothill pine. Um, it's otherwise known as gray pine or ghost pine or bull pine. It's all the same tree. <laughs> it is, um, and it is you know it is a native um, it is a native species you know kind of in our in our foothill range and. It, it is a very weird tree in the sense that it grows right at these lower elevations in these areas where we really don't get much precip. But it really is now feeling the effects of having even less water than what it's normally used to. And it does have this completely separate complement of bark beetles um, or insects or damaging agents that feed on it. So my recommendation for just you know, just protecting any gray pines on your property is just again those basic, those same basic forestry practices I recommend for your pines or your sugar pines or your incense cedars. You know, again, assure good growing space, reduce competition, reduce mechanical um, or any kind of injury. Watering again may help. Not too sure about that. Um, gray pine is one that's notorious for getting dwarf mistletoe infections. That you know that really weird bunchy plant um, that you see. And if you can prune those out, again, that helps reduce kind of the stress load on the trees. And promoting regeneration. Uh, this is this is not a long-lived tree. Again, it lives in the foothills where it doesn't have a whole lot of water, so it doesn't live as long um, as our ponderosa pines do. So if you lose a, um, so if you lose one of these trees, you know, and there's uh, little ones growing underneath, you know, promote those. Treat those the same way as you treat your bigger trees. Promote that regeneration. Um, I have been asked about incense cedar, and incense cedar, just like giant sequoias, 
are one of the very few trees that do not have a primary bark beetle. These um, trees are mostly killed off by diseases, so they take a long time to die. However, with incense cedar, it's, this one doesn't have the triangle on it. Uh, this one really is just directly, you know, it has a bunch of secondary insects, um, uh, insects and diseases, but it really is tied to kind of the soil conditions and the site conditions its environment. And this drought is really doing a number on incense cedar right now. This drought is, is so severe to the incense cedar, you might see large patches of die-off of even the regeneration happening, where it looks like a fire, but simply they're just not getting the water that they're used to. And so, you know, you might hack into a tree and see bark beetle galleries or galleries of some sort, but really it's the drought that's affecting them the most. So again, just basic forestry practices, I'd say the same thing for incense cedar, reduce tree density and competing vegetation, uh, prevent soil um, and avoid soil compaction, avoid any roots, root or trunk injury, same thing as any other tree, and that's it. So if you have any questions.